Hey everybody, what's going on? Dustin here with another Histobrick review and today we got ourselves our first ever French liner and that is the SS Normandy, the rival to the Cunard White Stars and RMS Queen Mary. So we got another ship to add into the Blue Ribbon collection and looking up I actually do have the RMS Lusitania and the RMS Queen Mary. However, I do happen to have the French liner for, for the, the Blue Ribbon collection. Now, the SS Normandy is a French liner, followed by, which is part of the. Now, forgive me if I'm very not fluent with French. It's actually called CG Transatlantique or we'll just call it French line for short. Now, if my narration kind of butchers the French narr the French words, now keep in mind I'm very not fluent with French. I do apologize to our French watchers. So yeah, so this is the SS Normandy thing right here. Now, it is actually a limited, a limited edition model. I just happen to have this is limited to 25. And it is hand signed by Tom himself from Histobrick. So, Tom, if you're watching this, thank you. So, and I might as well go ahead and get cracking on this. Alright, so we got my familiar workspace right here. Now, I already done ahead, went ahead and took out the instruction book because when I first got this, I wasn't actually going to do it right away. Considering what I actually did have going on was a class reunion, as you can see here. Yeah, class of 2013, so I do have the box, so it's right back behind me. So here it is now. Just like I did with the, uh, the Carl D. Bradley sleeve, I will actually keep the sleeve because it's hand signed anyway. Along with this nice big pistol brick box right here. Ooh, this is a big one too. So inside we got some small and printed pieces. Tan, tan, bright reds, whites, and we also have some little color pieces this is in here. Color pieces such as black, gray, white, and dark red. So to do so without further ado I'm actually going to go ahead clear out this workspace right here before I do that go ahead put this box back together and as always it comes with a little thank you for your purchase note for your for your support note and also, also if you have any questions regarding you might bring it a little bit closer there we go you can always email Tom from Histobrick for missing parts or anything so without further ado I'm going to go ahead and get cracking on this. Alright, thumbs up means that we are underway building the SS Normandy. So the SS Normandy is a French ocean liner built in Saint Nazaire, France for the French line. Now forgive me if I actually do butcher this name. Capagne Generale Transatlantique or CGT. But for now, we'll just call it the French Line. She would enter passenger service in 1935 and actually became the largest passenger ship afloat, which will cross the Atlantic in a record of 4.14 days and remains actually the most powerful steam turbo electric propelled passenger ship ever built. Her design is lavish and tears led to many considering her to be the greatest ocean liner and would heavily influence the French arm of the steam line modern design and movement called the style like boat or ocean liner style. However, when World War II hit around, the SS Normandy was still in the United States at the time and it was actually held by the U.S. government in case of any form of sabotage. But unfortunately, on December 7th, 1941, Japan would attack Pearl Harbor and basically plans changed for the SS Normandy. A couple of weeks after the Pearl Harbor attack, 
auxiliary vessels board officially recorded President Franklin D. Roosevelt's approval of the Normandy's transfer to the United States Navy, so there was actually plans called for a troop vessel to be turned into a troop ship, so the U.S. Navy actually renamed the Normandy the USS Lafayette in honor to, of both the Marquis de Lafayette, who's actually a French general who fought on the colony's behalf in the American Revolution. Entering 1942, the vessel is classified as a transport or AP-53. There were plans of converting the Lafayette into an aircraft carrier, but it was actually dropped in favor of immediate troop transport. It was actually more to Pier 88 for the conversion, so a contract for conversion to a troop transport was actually awarded to Robbins Dry Dock and Repair Company, who's actually a subsidiary of Todd Shipyards on 27th of December 1941. Captain Clayton M. Simmers, the third Naval District Material Officer, reported to the Bureau of Ships, or U Ships, this estimate that the conversion would work could be completed by January 31st, 1942, and planning for the work actually proceeded at that basis. So basically, the Lafayette's prospective commanding officer on 31st of January 1942, who actually overseed a skeleton engineering force numbering of 458 men, so the complicated nature and enormous size of the conversion effort prevented Coleman's crew from adhering to the original schedule, so the crew familiarization with the vessel was actually a huge issue. On February 6, 1942, a request for a two-week delay for the first sailing of the Lafayette, originally scheduled for February 14th, was submitted to the Assistant Chief of Naval Operations. On that date, a schedule extension was granted due to the design plan change. Orders came from Washington on February 7th that the reduction of the top hamper has been abandoned and the Lafayette was to set sail on the 14th of February as planned. So this abrupt reversal necessitated a frantic resumption of conversion work and Captain Snowman and Simmer scheduled 9th of February, so meetings in New York and Washington to the lobby for further clar clarification of conversion plans. Ultimately, these meetings actually never took place. But however, on the 9th of February, 1942, at 2.30 p.m., a workman by the name of Clement Derrick, who is a welder, ignited a stack of life vests while he was using a welding torch, and how these life vests are actually filled with a flammable capoc, which is actually a tree native in Mexico, that had been stored in the Lafayette's first-class lounge. And the next thing to go was a flammable varnished woodwork that has not yet been removed, and the fire actually spread quickly. It had a very efficient fire protective system, but it's actually been disconnected during the conversion as this internal pumping system was deactivated, and I will explain more of that in the uh, upcoming documentary. As the fire department arrived on scene, their hoses did not fit the ship's French inlets, and before the fire department arrived approximately 15 minutes later, the fire broke out. Onboard crew were using manual means in a vain attempt to stop the blaze, and a northwesterly wind actually blew over the Lafayette's port quarter, swept the blaze forward, consuming the three upper decks of the ship within an hour of the start of the conflagration. Captain Coleman, along with Captain Simmers, arrived at 15.25 or 3.25 p.m. to see his prospect command up in flames. As firefighters on shore and fireboats poured water onto the blaze, there's actually a notable fireboat that I actually narrated on History Inside a Nutshell called the John J. Harvey, to which I will actually include that as well. So if you want to check out more about the John J. Harvey, I will leave a uh, video card up at the top of your screen. I actually narrate that one, and that one was actually uh, very commemorative because that was actually on the anniversary of 9 11. Anyway, back to this. So the Lafayette actually developed a dangerous list to port due to the water pump into the seaward side by the fireboats. And Vladimir Yorkovich, who actually did arrive on scene, and try to offer some help, but it was actually barred by the harbor police. Like, come on. I understand it's a dangerous situation, but at least let the designer buy so that way he can offer the fire department some advice. That's like not allowing Thomas Andrews on board the Titanic, offering advice about the ship's specifications and everything. 
so Yorkovich's suggestion was to enter the vessel and open up the seacocks, so this would flood the lower decks and make her settle a few feet into the bottom, and with the ship stabilized, water could be pumped into the burning areas without the risk of capsizing, but unfortunately, Rear Admiral Adolphus Andrews, commander of the 3rd Naval District, rejected that idea. The fire would be under control between 5.45 and 6 p.m. on February 9th, as authorities considered the fire under control and began winding down operations until 8. So the water entering the Lafayette through submerged openings and flow into the lowering decks negated efforts to counter flood, and her list of port gradually increased badly. So shortly after midnight, Rear Admiral Andrews ordered the Lafayette abandoned. As the ship continued to list, a process hastened by the 6,000 tons of water that has been sprayed on her, New York fire officials were concerned that the fire could spread in nearby buildings, so the Lafayette eventually capsized during the mid-watch, which is basically 2.45 in the morning on February 10th, nearly crushing a fireboat, and came to rest on her port side at an angle of approximately 80 degrees. Recognizing that this incompetence had caused a disaster, Rear Admiral Andrews ordered all pressmen barred from viewing the moment, but capsized in an effort to lower the level of publicity. And, to be honest, that actually did not stop a certain cinematographer, to which I will mention right now. If you notice in the 1942 film Salvatore, which is a film by none other than Alfred Hitchcock, actually did feature the ship in the movie, but it was, to be fair though, it was not identified in the film, but the antagonist smiled at it when he sees it in a taxi, suggesting that he was actually responsible for it. However, Hitchcock stated that the Navy raised hell about the implication that their security was so poor, so that basically tells you how horrible their security was. So. Yes, enemy sabotage is, was widely sus suspected, but a congressional investigation in the wake of the sinking chaired by Representative Patrick Henry Dewey concluded that the fire was completely accidental. So the, their investigation found evidence of carelessness, rules violation, lack of coordination between the various uh, parties on board, lack of clear command structure during the fire, and a hasty, poorly planned conversion effort. Now keep this in mind though, 1940s around that time was huge for organized crime around that time frame. So members retrospectively claimed that they had sabotaged the vessel. It was actually alleged that arson has been organized by the mobster Anthony Anastasio, who is actually a power in the local longshoremen's union to provide leverage for the release of the mob boss Charles Lucanio or Lucky from prison. Luciano's end of the bargain was to ensure that there would be no further enemy sabotage in the ports where the mob had strong influence with the unions. And I think I forgot to mention this one. Unfortunately, one man did die in the tragedy. Uh, Fra Frank Trent Trent Acosta, 36, of Brooklyn, who is actually a member of the Firewatch. However, some 94 U.S. Coast Guardsmen and Navy sailors, including some from Lafayette's pre-commissioning crew, and men assigned to the receiving ship, the USS Seattle. 38 firefighters and 153 civilians were actually treated for various injuries, burns, smoke inhalation, and exposure. So this is actually one of the largest, most expensive salvage operations of its kind, estimated at $5 million at the time. And keep this in mind though, the most expensive one was the Costa Concordia, which ran up to two billion dollars. The ship was stripped of its superstructure, was basically converted into an aircraft and transport ferry on September 15th of 1943, and actually placed in a dry dock the following month. But then again, the extensive damage to her hull, the deterioration of her machinery, actually would cost up much more and was declared a total loss. So the Lafayette was stricken from the Naval Vessel Register on October 11th in 1945 without ever having sailed under the United States flag. Harry Truman authorized her disposal in an executive order on September 8th in 1946 and she was sold for scrap on October 3rd in 1946 to Lipset Incorporated which is an American salvage company 
based in New York City for $161,680. After neither the Navy nor the French line offered a plan to salvage her, Yorkovich, who's actually the original designer, proposed to cut the ship down and restore her as a mid-sized liner, but this also failed to draw it back. So she went for scrap the beginning in October 1946 at Port Newark, New Jersey, and completely scrapped by December 31st of 1948. Such a way that ship had to go out, unfortunately. Once a proud liner for the CGT to burning and capsizing in the New York Harbor. However, if you look at the silhouette of the Normandy, it actually helped influence ocean liners over the decades, which actually did ironically included the rival company Cunard for Queen Mary too. But the Omni is actually a transatlantic ocean liner, it's like the Normandy and Queen Mary would actually help inspire for Disney Cruise Line smashing vessels the Disney Magic, Disney Wonder, Disney Dream, and Disney Fantasy. But however, the Normandy also even inspired the architecture and design of the Normandy Hotel in San Juan, Puerto Rico. If you actually look at the roof sign, it's actually one of the two signs that adorn the top deck of the Normandy, but were actually removed from it during an early refitting. It also inspired the nickname of the Normandy given by the International Savings Society Apartments in Shanghai, which is actually one of the most fashionable residential buildings during the city's pre-revolutionary heyday and home to several stars of China's mid 20th century film industry. And as you may notice that in the time-lapse build, this is actually the longest anti-fouling that I have ever built on the vessel. Like, I understand for the Lusitania, and hopefully the Mauritania, if I ever get that model, the Titanic, Britannic, and Olympic. They were pretty se self-explanatory when it comes to building them, and they weren't even that bad, though. But this one is just incredibly long, and there I go, going for my little uh, back spare parts. I thought I was missing a dark red 1x2, but I found it post-video, so I'm like, you know what, it's not going to matter anyway. It's hidden, so I'm really not going to worry about it. I say, oh my god, you know what I mean? So there I am actually building the, uh, I think those would be the, okay, that's the starboard side. For the bow. And of course connecting that, uh, hinge piece and also right there. And also getting to work on the, uh, the back part of the antiphalic, which basically be the, uh, for the other propellers now keep this in mind though the normandy at one point actually did have a set of four three-bladed propellers on launch and they would be refitted with a four-bladed ones and looking at the normandy's general characteristics and i think i should go through as a the specifications but i'm actually going to go through characteristics 79,280 gross register tons from 1935 to 1936 and 83,423 gross register tons post-1936 and actually kept that way. We had a length of 313.6 meters, a beam of 35.9 meters, height of 56.1 meters, draught of 11.2 meters, depth of 28 meters to promenade, 12 decks, 4 turboelectric, which are a total of 160,000 horsepower. She was designed to go up to 29 and a half knots, but she was actually rec recorded 32.2 knots recorded on the trials, and actually has a capacity of 1,972. And of course, specifications is she's owned by the CGT, Port of Registry of Sea. I think I might butcher this name. Port of Le Haver. The builder was a Chatelier de Pinhoret of Saint Nazare, France. Forgive me if I butcher that. Laid down on January 26, 1931. Launched the following year on October 29, 1932. 
It was actually christened that same year too, and completed in 1933, and completed its maiden voyage on May 29th in 1935. However, she would be out of service, like I said, in the beginning, in 1942, after catching on fire, capsized, in 1942, then later scrapped in a few years. However, I may get around to the interior, but I will actually do explain a little bit of it. The Normandy's luxurious interiors were actually designed in Art Deco and Streamlined Modern style by Pierre Padout, who is actually one of the founders of Art Deco style. So the sculptures and wall paintings made allusions to Normandy, the provenance of France for which the ship was actually named, and drawings and photographs show a series of vast public rooms of great elegance, and voluminous interior space were actually made possible by having the final uptake split to pass along the sides of the ship, rather than straight upward. And French architect Roger Henry Expert was in charge of the overall decorative scheme. However, most of that public space is actually devoted to first-class passengers, which includes the dining room, the first-class lounge, the grill room, first-class swimming pool, theater, and winter garden. However, that first-class swimming pool featured staggered depths, which is a shallow training beach for children. The dining room for children is actually designed by Jean de Bunoff, who covered the walls with Robert the Elephant and his entourage. Again, I'm not fluent with French. The interiors are actually filled with grand perspectives, spectacular entryways, and long, wide staircases. So first-class suites were actually given unique designs by special designers. So the most luxurious accommodations were actually the Belleville and Troutville apartments, which actually featured dining rooms, baby grand pianos, multiple bedrooms, and private decks. The first-class dining hall was actually the largest room afloat, at 305 feet, it was actually longer than the Hall of Mirrors at the Palace of Versailles, a 46 feet wide and 28 feet high. Pastors can actually enter through the six tall door, six meter tall doors that adorn the bronze medallions. Anyway, here is an update video right now. Well, major update. After two long, excruciating hours, finally got the lower deck complete. SS Normandy. I imagine this thing is a beast build. And just learn it. This is a few parts, so I'm just gonna go ahead and click the build on. Much better. So yeah, this is the keel, the propellers, the rudder. And so this is basically gonna be the uh the largest one I'm actually going to build anyway, besides the uh, Arthur M. Anderson. And the Arthur M. Anderson one was not a time lapse. I never thought I'd want to do a time lapse video, but yeah, after I did the Carly Bradley, that's when I was like, you know what? Yeah, I got to talk to myself. So yeah, I'm going to keep cracking at this. It's uh, 11.40 at the moment where I'm at, and it's almost Sunday, so. Yeah, I don't know if I should have continued on or not. But then again, I got all these pieces out, so I think I'm going to continue on. Now, I actually did not realize this until I think a couple of minutes after. Was I actually did this in a regular videoing uh, and instead of a time lapse, so... Anyway, I'm actually going to continue on with my little narration. Now, imagine walking into those six meter tall doors that's adorned with the bronze medallions. And just happen to see the whole entire dining room. It can seat up to 700 at 157 tables, with Normandy serving as a floating promotion for the most sophisticated French cuisine of its period. And keep this in mind, no natural light can actually enter there. It was actually illuminated by 12 tall pillars of lacrimal glass flanked by 38 matching columns along the walls. Those along with the chandeliers hung at each of the room, earning for Normandy the nickname the Ship of Light. If you think about it, think of it as Paris as the City of Light.
Alright, as that was actually continued now, this part of the build is basically the spine of the ship. What actually holds the hull in place for the model. And it was very long, it was tedious, and it was basically repetitive when it comes to building this part, and it was incredibly excruciating. I asked myself, what do I got myself into while building the Normandy? And I didn't even realize that there were 431 steps, and I made the biggest mistake of doing this video, well, actually recording this video, at after I got back home from my class reunion, and I didn't even get done the hull and part of the superstructure until about 1.20 a.m. in the morning the following day. I never even realized that. I thought time kind of flew by. Like, I didn't have anything to drink. I didn't eat anything besides dinner at my class reunion. And you can basically see I'm starting to become very sluggish because usually I go to bed early around maybe 9, 10 o'clock at night and I'm just out like a light. So in a few seconds you're actually going to see me realize saying, oh I didn't uh, do a time lapse video for this part. Yeah, it was pretty much right here. Thing. I was thinking, oh crap, I did not put my video on time lapse. Oh, wait a minute, I forgot. Oops, forgot to turn on time lapse. Oh well, I'll pick up where I left off right here for time lapse. Now, while researching for a future documentary for the SS Normandy, the Normandy actually carried distinguishable passengers, which actually include the authors of, of Colette and Ernest Hemingway. I never knew that. The wife of French President Albert Le Brun, songwriters Noel Cowan and Irving Berlin, and Hollywood celebrities such as Fred Astaire, Marlene Dietrich, Walt Disney himself. I never knew that. Especially on the 100th anniversary of the Walt Disney Company, which is actually founded by Walt and Roy Disney together. And I tell you what, when I first heard about this, it actually, well, everyone knows this, I'm actually a moviegoer, and hearing the, the fact that Walt Disney himself boarded the SS Normandy, that actually brought my nerdiness out. Douglas Fairbanks Jr., Conductor Arturo Toscani and Jimmy Stewart. Yes, Jimmy Stewart, American actor, military officer, 80 films span from 1935 to 1991. She also carried the Von Trapp family singers of The Sound of Music from New York to Southampton in 1938. And from Southampton, the family went to Scan Scandinavia for a tour before returning to the United States. Now, however, the Normandy was actually supposed to have a planned running mate, which would be the SS Bretagne, as it was rarely occupied at over 60% of her usual casualty. But then again, her finances were s such that she did not require government subsidies every year, so she never repaid any of the loans that made her construction possible. So the CGT considered a sister ship named the SS Bretagne, which was to be longer and much larger. And there were two competing designs to the ship, and one, one was actually very conservative and one's very radical. The conservative design was actually essentially a Normandy like ship with two funnels and possibly larger, as the radical one from the Normandy's designer, Vladimir Yorkovich, was actually super streamlined with twin side by side funnels just at the aft bridge. However, the conservative sign won, to which I actually like the conservative sign better, even if it's two funnels. But the outbreak of the war halted to that plan indefinitely. Now, what's the one ship that has been a thorn to the SS Normandy side? None other than the 
converged Cunard White Star Line Superliner, the RMS Queen Mary. She would actually surpass the 80,000 tons for being the largest liner ever, but at 79,000 280 tons, the Normandy would no longer be the world's largest. So the CGT decided, okay, you know what, we're going to increase the size, mainly through the additional of an enclosed tourist lounge on the aft end of the boat deck. And following this and other alterations, she would measure 83,423 gross register tons, which exceeds the Queen Mary by 2,000 tons, and she would continue to be the largest ship in terms of overall measured gross register tonnage and length best in the Queen Mary, who actually entered service three weeks later. So, there was some beef between the Normandy and the Queen Mary going on. And no, we're not talking about fighting in any shape, way, or form. So, basically, however, there was actually an incident that involved with the SS Normandy. In June of 22nd of 1936, a Blackburn Baffin S5162 of A Flight Royal Air Force Gosport was actually flown by Lieutenant Guy Kennedy Horsey on a torpedo dropping practice, actually buzzed the Normandy two kilometers off Ride Pier, and actually collided with a derrick that was transferring a motor car belonging to Arthur Evans. Now, Arthur Evans is actually a member of Parliament. So basically, his car was actually involved in a collision with the plane with a derrick and it was being loaded onto a barge alongside the ship. So however, the aircraft crashed onto the Normandy's bow where the pilot was taken off by a tender but the wreckage of the aircraft remained on board the Normandy as she had sailed due to the tide. But however, it was carried to Le Havre and a salvage team from the Royal Air Force later removed the wreckage and Horsey was actually court-martialed and found guilty on two charges. But unfortunately, Evans' car was wrecked in the accident and was declared a total loss. However, back to the Normandy vs. Queen Mary story. In 1936, Queen Mary captured the, the Blue Ribbon, averaging of 30.14 knots, which actually started a fierce, rifle, fierce rivalry. It's basically... They're having beef with each other, like ship beef. The Normandy held the size record until the arrival of the RMS Queen Elizabeth with a gross register tons of 83,673 in 1940. So during the Normandy's refit, the Normandy was actually modified to reduce vibration, so her three-bladed propellers were replaced with four-bladed ones. And structural modifications were made to her aft lower aft section. So these modifications were put in place and basically helped reduce vibrations at speed. If you think about it, the Lusitania actually did have problems with vibrations. So basically they had to reinforce their stern so that way the cabins at the stern area can be livable. However, in 1937 in July, the Normandy regained the Blue Ribbon, but then again, the Queen Mary, being cheeky they are, snatched it back. After this, the captain of the Normandy sent a message to the Queen Mary, and this is their words, not mine. Bravo to the Queen Mary until next time. So this could have gone into the 1940s, but that kind of possibility ended at the Second World War. However, I did some research about this maiden voyage and she actually captured the blue ribbon for the first time. So the CGT actually refused to predict that their ship would win the blue ribbon and little they knew. Little they knew. By the time the ship reached New York, medallions of the blue ribbon victory, which actually made in Fran France, were delivered to passengers and the ship flew a 9 meter long or 30 feet blue pennant. An estimated 100,000 spectators lined the New York Harbor for Normandy's arrival. So all passengers were actually presented with a medal celebrating the occasion on behalf of CGT. Now, I will feature a very rare item that I actually did found. It was actually a medallion of the blue rib of the blue ribbon, and I've never seen it before. Like it was, it's just something. 
that you just wish it would exist, but it does. I never thought that they would just basically uh, award a ship like a ribbon. So basically, it's just like, we all know the blue ribbon is a, an official accolade, and that's why I said in the beginning that I have my blue ribbon ships up on the uh, top shelf, which is as normal. However, at the time of this video, I did order the SS United States. I'm thinking about ordering the the RMS Mauritania, so it kind of complete out. So, Tom, if you're actually watching this, we need the uh, Kaiser Wilhelm de Grossa and the RMS Lusitania in her RMS colors. I know you have plans for it. And, of course, the spine is finally completed. And just snapping it along the lower deck. And this is where we get to our second update in this video. Alright, so another update. The spinal structure. The center part right here is finished. So many mini builds. Yeah, it was just a finishing. So right now I'm debating whether I should go to bed or not, considering how late it is for me. But I like to get the normal done so that way I can uh, go to sleep. So I'm gonna keep keep, keep going. Uh, right now I'm up to uh, 216, and there's basically yeah, I did look over this. It was about 430 or 431 steps. Right now, I'm just about in the halfway mark, so I'm going to keep going. Alright, so back at it again on the hull of the ship itself. Now, you can actually really tell how tired I am in this one. I started doing this one around a little bit after midnight, so yeah, the star part is really, really easy whatsoever. And, of course, try and get the appropriate parts needed. It was at this point where I'm just in extremely tired. Like I just really got back from a class reunion and putting this ship together. I thought I was going to put it together all in one night, but unfortunately I was very, very wrong whatsoever. Here we go, searching through the parts, and of course uh, attaching the right pieces on and getting the stern shape the iconic back end of what the ship actually did look like and of course getting the uh, flares on now the normandy actually does have a uh, a streamlined modern design which is basically a international style art deco architecture design that actually did emerge in the uh, 1930s is ex exactly inspired by the aerodynamic design which emphasizes current forms, long horizontal lines, and sometimes nautical elements. So industrial design, it was actually used for locomotives, for railroads, telephones, toasters, buses, appliances, and more devices to give the impression of sleekness and modernity. In France, it was actually called the Style Pacteport, or ocean liner style. It was influenced by the design of the luxury ocean liner, the SS Stormy. A perfect one that I actually saw was the New York Central Hudson locomotive, which is the 464 Hudson steam type locomotive built by the American Locomotive Company. Baldwin and Lima Locomotive Works in three series from 1927 to 1938. Now, does anyone know if that ship is actually out there? Well, I can only wish. Unfortunately, the steam liner is scrapped, but basically on research about streamlined ships the uh, the first one used a streamlined design was the MV Kalakala which is uh, basically received a streamlined during 1933 to 1935 reconstruction and the ship actually operated in the Puget Sound near the northwestern coast of the US state of Washington it was only up until 1967 but unfortunately it was scrapped in 2015, to which is very, very sad to hear about that one. If 
only they could actually reuse it as a uh, museum ship, basically about the, uh, the streamlined design and the history of the ferry itself. And it was actually on the U.S. National Register of Historic Places. But then again, as fate would have it, she was, she was a hazard to navigation in 2011, but after being declared by the U.S. Coast Guard and unable to raise funds required for the restoration, it was actually scrapped in 2015. Now, for the streamlined design of the ship itself, especially on a histobrick model, I can see there is possibly a lot of good challenges from Tom from Histobrick actually doing that. But then again, the finished product of the streamlined design actually does look very, very nice. Which I will compliment Tom on that. And of course, that only blue piece on there, that's for the swimming pool and that's in the uh, aft section. And there I go, looking down at the uh, instructions. And of course, trying to get the what appears to be is the uh, port side and now the starboard side to get the hull in together as one. There we go. Oh, yep, just putting those uh, what appears to be a uh, flat with the uh, studs up on top, and of course, just doing repeats after repeats. There are a few sub mini builds in this one to which I'm kind of gr grand on, not gonna lie. And of course, I did drop something, so I had to pick that up. Excuse me for the cough. And putting those little uh, angle bracket pieces on. That's basically for the superstructure. There's the part of it, and of course, it goes along smoothly like clockwork. Yeah, so there's a lot of these angle pieces, which basically is for the superstructure of the ship. And of course, just looking at, looking at it now. The number is actually kind of play, played weirdly on me. And of course, now doing the uh, the starboard side, I did the port side. And of course, they had to change some around to which so that way it could uh, accommodate. Make sure I got the uh, the right appropriate numbers, and go along down the side again. Now, if you actually do notice a little bit of a voice in there, that's basically for the uh, basically for the uh, the curvature of the ship as well. And of course, put more angle piece now. The last one, the white one. Yep, scratch my head, thinking where is it at. And especially in all that white, it was like, where is it? Like, I understand putting the color, putting the parts in their correct colors, but putting it all in one bag is just really plays mind games on me. And of course, adding more pieces onto the uh, the spine, which is the center of the ship that connects the uh, the lower and the upper hulls together. And of course, make it, looking off at the instruction book, making sure that, okay, this is what I have, make sure this is on there, make sure this is on there, because those are actually going to be in play later on. And of course, looking at that. And putting the uh, flat tiles alongside the uh, superstructure, alongside. Therefore, the uh, superstructure is coming together quite nicely. And of course, there's another one there. Flip it over on the port side and repeat the same process again. And look at the uh, amazing hull on, on for the lower deck. So this is where most of the majority of the black pieces are now. If you get a little bit of leftover blacks at this point, they're for the funnel assemblies to which uh, I will actually go over later on in this video about what their uh, purposes are. Now the Normandy does have three funnels, but only one of them is actually used for a different purpose, kind of like the Titanic and the Olympic and the Britannic's fourth funnel. Well, I could have just said Olympic class sliders, but that's too mainstream for me to say that. So, there I go, constructing the, the hull, the superstructure on the uh, port side. 
and if you notice I don't have my trusty brick separator with me unfortunately because I used it for the last build which was the Andre Doria and I put it down and I don't know where it's at so that may be a casualty for that I know now keeping it going right now this Right now, I'm up at the bow of the ship, and this one's going to be one of those uh, complicated builds. And of course, just building a little mini assembly right here. Which is, I think this is basically part of the superstructure. It is white. Yes, I can see it. And this is just basically uh, the assembly for the... Yep. Additional parts for the superstructure of the ship, and of course, take a drink as well. So, yeah, so these two parts right here this is basically the assembly for the aft part of the superstructure of the SS Normandy, which is basically like right before where the swimming pool is. Since you can't actually use the angle pieces, so yeah, you have to really have to manually build the these parts and and there we go there's another one on there and of course look in right now at this uh, big massive pile of pieces and of course these two curved parts these are basically for the uh, the top decks of the ship goes one right there okay I'm looking now and making sure it's on there and another one there and there's that iconic aft end of the uh, ship and now working on the uh, the front part of the ship which is basically the bow of the Normandy putting those gray ankle angle pieces on and of course the uh, mini assembly for the front parts which is basically the for the prow of the ship itself which will have the name the Normandy which is basically on a flat tile angle piece look through making sure I have the right parts and of course this is where another of those uh, angle pieces did come in which is basically the name of the Normandy. There we are. Now, if you notice, I did not spill out the uh, the printed pieces on the table. I like to keep them in the bag. So there goes one section of the ship, and of course, look at back at there. And also, here we go again. This time for the port side, which is basically repeat of the same build and you can really tell how tired I am how groggy I am and there we go they yawn right there so yeah I am definitely tired up at this point and this is where I kind of decided you know what I think after the, building the hull of the ship itself I'm just gonna stop and just uh, go off sleep because there's no point uh, continuing on at the moment so yeah, I just want to get one part done before going to bed, so yeah, construct the other side of the bow of the ship itself. And look at that, there again. And the angle piece again, the flat right angle piece with the Normandy nameplate on it. Putting it on there. Seriously, how many times am I going to yawn in this one? It's like, if you think about it, I was building this at 1 a.m. in the morning. Really tired. Came back from a uh, from a class reunion party down at a country club. And now just, uh, I just want to wish myself, I just want to get this done and then go to bed. So yeah, there's that top piece on there and also the prow assembly. Right length there. 
and of course the uh, mini build of the bow itself. Flip another page over, yep, put it on there. And it may look it may look like that is complete, but actually at this point it is not very complete itself whatsoever. And hopefully that I was I was really hoping to myself I was gonna get this done before midnight, but unfortunately it did not work out the way it intended. So yeah, I was putting those a little triangle pieces on there. Make it blend in. And I think that that's where I wrapped it up for the night right there. Oh, well, this is the point where I'm going to stop. So, update on the hull. The, the lower hull is complete. You can see the Normandy's nameplate up on the bow. Really beautiful touch. Stern is incredibly well built. built. And since it's tomorrow already, uh, might as well get to work on the superstructure, but for now, I guess I'm going to head off to bed and just uh, wrap this up tomorrow. The next day. Alright, so this is day two of the SS Normandy build. And last night was basically the majority, majority of putting the hull together, which Done. And... Sorry, that was my alarm clock. So, I think it's gonna be time to finish the rest today. And don't allow me to go to his or break model all the way up until midnight. And finally, the next day. I got to work on the front part of the ship, which is basically the uh, the breakwater, water, and how symbolical it is to have a little white heart on the front of the ship. Just kind of cute, though. And of course, putting those little angle pieces on, I think that will represent the uh, curvature of the, uh, the superstructure itself. And of course, putting those. Uh, Flat studded tiles on the length of the ship. Just all the way down. Yep. Kind of symbolical to have a cute little white heart brick on the front end of the ship. And there's actually a red one on the Normandy. And I can imagine that, yeah, if they want to express their love of the uh, SS Normandy, might as well have this piece right there. It's actually not the first time they actually used that red heart piece. There were actually four of them for the uh, the SS Californian set, to which I didn't really do a time lapse build of that one because then again, I never thought of wanting to do a time lapse video of the, the SS California or any or any other ship that I have built already. So it would seem unfair to take tear them all down and basically have to rebuild them just for time lapse. And of course, if you actually did saw it in the background, up above my head was the uh, a neon light strip. Don't know if anyone caught that. Yeah, I actually installed that one, and I basically had a flash of red, white, and blue for the uh, French tricolor. It's a buckle now. Those big tile pieces, those are basically for the deck itself. That's where the light posts will be. So yeah. Majority of the white parts for this one is basically for the superstructure itself and also the top deck as well. And basically go along back down and then of course finish up right back there. And it looks good. Which I will admit. And of course but the more of the uh, internal pieces inside as well it moves some bricks around try to copy try to make it all fit so, so that way I can be able to complete Normandy 
in the morning. And a little known fact, I actually uh, went to bed after finishing the uh, the SS Normandy. It was like, it took me so long to build it, and I was like, you know what, I'm just going to take a little nap. Originally, I took a nap and woke up almost at 12 o'clock. I was like, oh, man, where this time has gone by. And I don't know if anyone is actually noticing this until now. Yes, I have been playing French music in the background of this time-lapse build. I figure, you know what, I figure I want to add some background music. Just kind of have the mood going. And basically, I did. Now, I just put those uh, parts for the... Uh, for the start itself, not where the, the not where the third phone is going to be, and of course I'm actually working my way on uh, my way down. Just try to do uh, this now. I was just looking over, going, hmm, "Am I missing something?" Yep, did right there. Next page. Just looking at it, just glancing at it. You'll see me glance at the ship in a few seconds. Basically, gonna be right about right about there anyway. So yeah, the SS Normandy model it's actually really did took a huge toll, but yeah, it actually does look good though. I will give a uh, top from Histobrick this. It actually does look very good. It's actually very well built, even though it was on a limited time only run. I can't help but say I'm proud to have this uh, vessel in my. Uh, not only my ship collection, but also in my Blue Ribbon Band collection as well. So, just working on the, uh, the aft part of the uh, superstructure. And of course, there's a lot of these uh, flat pieces that need to go somewhere. Trying to uh, build up that part where around the third funnel is going to stand, and of course, going back up to the front, you know, making sure that everything's all connected all together. Now, keep this in mind, I actually did this around from where my alarm clock went off. It was about 8:30 in the morning, around that time. But you got to think about this. I had a little bit amount of sleep, and of course, my light went out right there. There's a wire that I think that's my charging wire. I really didn't expect that to be there. Usually, I would run it outside of the viewing area, basically, uh, right up and basically connect from the top. So, there I was glancing at the uh, pile of parts, to which it's actually starting to shrink down to my surprising. And of course, going back in there. there wheelhouse and oops something actually did came apart there it's always that one little nuisance spot where you just don't expect that it would basically come apart and basically it is try to uh, rebuild it around that spot and basically try to, to improvise it make it look a little bit better Unfortunately, it does. The trick it was for me, I just had a one by one flat tile instead of the one by one stud that it actually uh, requested, required in the instructions. Sometimes it will pop up, but again, it's not as bad as it was. So now I'm building this part around where the where the derricks are, which is basically the uh, the cargo cranes for the SS Normandy. Go right there. A little bit higher than usual. So, yeah, working on the, uh, the top part of the superstructure around at this point. Basically, just keep looking at the instructions, and this is where the mini builds are going to be required. Going to be along the way. And then building the decking there, and of course those angled stud pieces there which is basically going to be like for part of the boat deck and also for the lifeboats as well 
Now, the lifeboats is actually with a another illegal building technique, which is basically putting flats on hooks. I think they're now legal because these are these hooks. Are, I don't know if I call them hooks or grabbers. I will call them basically grabbers because they will hold on to just about anything, either rod pieces or basically uh, flat pieces, such as the lifeboats, for example. And they actually really hold up real well. These are basically some of the newer models. It doesn't break like the old ones. So there I go, basically working on one of those right now at the moment. that upside down, basically put those uh, angle pieces on. And then just put it perfectly at its uh, spot of where it needs to be. Now I'm not sure about that brown shaft piece or where does it go to. It's kind of odd. So yeah, that Flat piece is kind of, you have to angle it kind of slightly in order to make it fit. And of course, of course I did. And basically, I think I'm going to be working on the other side. And the more life goes, the more barrier. Now, the, the Normandy was actually built at a time post Titanic disaster where there was enough life boats for all on board. Even the, uh, RMS Queen Mary, to which we will see later on, actually requires all ships to have enough lifeboats for all on board. There I go, I was actually... And there we go, just putting that midsection up in the midsection of the uh, boat deck. And here I am just looking, thinking, did I just miss a step or something? And then it just made me realize, hmm, did I miss the uh, the port side as well? Because if I did miss the port side, I'm just basically going to mirror what I did on the starboard side and let it reflect on the uh, port side. So there we go, putting those together. As a matter of fact, I'm actually mirroring that same build right now for the other side as well. Put those on. That's good. Put that shaft piece on there. And then the lifeboats. And finally, it goes on there. I mean, Normandy is coming along really, really well. And now the midship part of the boat deck with the lifeboats is coming along together and you can actually see that this pile is actually getting very very much smaller and smaller now and if you actually notice there is a half of a uh, half oval piece in the shadows to which I actually uh, not notice those would actually represent the uh, the rooms or the rooms or the uh, I want to say cabins or basically some of the other uh, on-ship facilities that the ship has. There we go, put those uh, holders on there, put them on the other side, put those angle pieces on. And then of course, the lifeboats, the tan lifeboats. I was surprised that they're actually tan instead of white. And there we go. That one's placed on the starboard side. And flip. And of course, I did flip it around. And basically, I put some uh, some other smaller pieces down inside the uh, in that area as well because it's basically the only opportunity that you can do to get those parts in there and. Also build the uh, the last of the uh, the boat deck structures, and you'd be done from there. So there we go. The last part of the uh, the boat of the boat deck with the lifeboats, and 
it's going along quickly right here at this point. Looking down, thinking, and grab as I go. And just keep going and going and going. And of course, that part right there I just put on is basically going to be for the, uh, the aft mass of the ship. <laughs> Sounds like a truck backfiring out there. I don't know if my uh, Mike caught it on can Mike caught it or what, so. Yeah. yeah, that is just basically alarm clock went off again and basically put the ship off to the side once again. And this time, this is where the funnels actually come into play. So the funnels to the ship is basically a streamlined construction. They're actually built a little much more bigger and much more wider. And of course with the uh, CGT line colors of red and black. And of course the first two are functional since they actually do connect down to the inside of the ship. But the third one is actually a unit for air conditioning systems and also for the uh, onboard kennel as well. So, at least it still has a purpose, though. That's why I always love about the aesthetic funnels is that they actually still serve a purpose. Like, for example, with Titanic, with the, uh, well, of course, Titanic, uh, but of course, the Olympic class liners. As we know, the Lusitania and Mauritania's funnels happen to be uh, real funnels since they actually do connect down to the boiler room. However, for Olympic classes cases, there's always that fourth funnel to where it's there for looks, but it still has a purpose though. That's what the Normandy try goes off of. And then basically, of course, the Queen Mary actually went along with that as well. So basically, the Normandy and the Queen Mary's funnels, two functioning ones, plus a third one for aesthetic looks, but I'll tell you one thing, the assembly for these funnels aren't that bad whatsoever. Of course, it is a little bit complicated, a little bit challenging. But then again, the final product of the ship actually does look pretty good though. Which, which I will admit, the SS Normandy does look good. Even as a French liner itself, it actually still looks good. Even after its unfortunate demise in 1942. You know... A fancy ship was about to be involved into a world war as a troop carrier, but unfortunately met its demise in a fire. So there goes the second funnel. And many would actually not know about this, but I actually covered it earlier in this video. It's basically the, uh, the Normandy was supposed to have a sister ship, but that actually got scrapped during the outbreak of the second world war which is very very unfortunate now here we go on the third funnel which is basically a dummy funnel but it basically serves a purpose though just like the uh, the RMS Queen Mary it actually still has a purpose this one is just basically for air conditioning for the whole entire ship itself <laughs> and also help provide air conditioning for the kettles as well and finally, the moment of truth, the last funnel for this ship. So, yeah, sometimes there are some pieces that keep popping off. I think there was one I caught on camera, but I don't know if that was blew up or not. So, there goes the last funnel on. Yeah, once you put the funnels on there, it basically goes like clockwork from here. You basically finish up on the smaller details. And then you have those 1 by 4 Normandy names, which would light up. And then both of the masts, which, which would be on the ship, and you're done there. Well, <clears throat> well we got it done. Got the SS Normandy model done. Not that ship, but one thing I actually didn't have an issue with was the front part up here. Which will not in place. Hopefully there's a little bit of way, so I may try to find a way to keep it all together. So yeah, Normandy, we restack the ship, 
uh, the French line. From the starboard side. Bow. The stern. I really like the stern though. It's really well put together. Port side as well. Really know which one's a witch. Like this last one right here is basically used for air conditioning. And you can see the main ones right here. There are some assortment of the printed bricks on here, printed UV. How like the Normandy sign right here. There's actually one one being used in the hotel though, a lot found out. Also have the picture Normandy bow pieces as well. And also the real house up here. And a lot of folks, just like the just like with the Andrew Doria, these are actually stuck on together with friction onto the uh, hook pieces. There we go. I brought her rival counterpart, the RMS Queen Mary. I know I said Olympic, but I meant Queen Mary, so I apologize on that one. Okay, these two, what these two have in common, they're both rivals, and they're also both holders of the blue ribbon. And for those who don't know, I actually do have a shelf dedicated just for the blue ribbon ships. And I think the next one I'm going to do is the SS United States, which is also going to round off these three, uh, big three blue ribbon holders and the Mauritania one I'm actually debating on whether I should get that one so hang around for that one so I think that I think that'd be all for this time I've spilled so if you like this leave a like comment on here subscribe for more history break time lapse builds I try to do them I can so keep a lookout from there and also I will be doing a documentary on both of these ships well, basically, I will be doing a documentary on the SS Normandy. This will be sometime soon. And maybe after that one, maybe do a documentary on the RMS Queen Mary. To which covering the, these two rivals together is going to be legendary. And I wonder how they're going to fare up against each other if I leave them alone in this house. So, anyway be all for this video so my name is Dustin and I will see you guys in another video